In our last video, we talked about analyzing transactions for purchases. So we were looking at it from the standpoint of us being the buyer. What we're going to look at now is the perpetual system and what it looks like from the standpoint of the seller. Um, so the top of the income statement has um, this new figure that we talked about in one of the earlier videos in this chapter um, called gross profit. And what the gross profit is, is the you've got the, the sales that you've made, imagine those are up here. Then we subtract all of the discounts, any returns, any allowances, and then this gets us to net sales. And from net sales, we're going to subtract the cost that we paid for those items that we sold. That gets us to gross profit. Then from gross profit is where we start subtracting our expenses, our rent, our payroll, our utilities, all of those things. And then um, once we've subtracted all our expenses from that, that gets us to net income. When we sell items on the perpetual system, we have two different entries that we make. Uh, because remember, what differentiates the perpetual from the periodic system is in the perpetual system, we are uh, making inventory adjustments for every item that goes out the door so that we already know, we, we still know basically in real time what we have left in our warehouse. So because of that, we've got to have two parts to record every transaction that of uh, items that we're selling under the perpetual system. The first one is going to record the revenue. The second one is going to address the cost of goods sold and the reduction in inventory. Come on. Oh. So when we sell an item, here are both of those journal entries that would meet, we would make under the perpetual system and this assumes that we've sold this item on, or these items on account. So the first entry here takes count of the the sale itself. We've got the sale and then the accounts revenue or accounts receivable sorry uh, and this sale was for a thousand dollars. Now we paid $300 for the item that we turned around and sold for $1,000. So we need to account for the $300 that we paid for it so it will show up in that cost of goods sold section on our income statement and we also want to reduce our inventory count by that amount and that's what this second entry does. So we record the cost of goods sold of $300 and then the merchandise inventory is credited to reduce the merchandise uh, inventory balance by the 300 of the items that we sold. So in very quick math, what kind of profit did we make on this sale? And if you said $700, you would be correct. We sold something for $1,000 that we only paid 300 for. So we made $700 on this sale. Now, when we are the seller, we talked about the discounts from the buyer's standpoint, but as the seller, we're going to be accounting for those discounts as well. And it's the same discount period, the same concept in terms of trying to get cash in the door more quickly. Uh, so in our, back to our thousand dollar sale example we've got those entries up here but now we've got the buyer that's going to pay us we're going to extend that discount that two percent discount to the buyer and they're going to take advantage of that so we're going to have a new account that you haven't seen before called sales discounts and we're going to debit the sales discounts account for twenty dollars um, they're going to pay us the rest of what they owe because they're not going to get the discount if they don't pay us. So they're going to pay us the $980 and then we're going to credit their accounts receivable for the full thousand and then that takes that amount off the books. And I'm going to move this and I should point out that our terms here are 210 net 45. Uh, now 
the below item here uh, journal entry is an assumption that the buyer doesn't take advantage of the discount and they just pay us at some point um, sometime after 10 days but before 45 days and we get this time the full thousand dollars cash and then we reduce their accounts receivable by the thousand dollars now sometimes we are on the receiving end of an unhappy customer and we have sold something or shipped something that's wrong defective you know whatever but now we've got an unhappy customer and we're gonna try and make this right and we're gonna do that in one of two ways either we're going to take some money off the purchase um, and let the, the customer uh, pay us less as a result of the defect or the inconvenience or whatever we decide to call it. But we're going to reduce the price that we had originally charged. Then, you know, the other option is that we just say to the customer, okay, send it back. We'll just take it back and we'll give you your money back. And so when we were the purchaser, we talked about this in terms of purchase returns and allowances. Now that we're the seller, we're, our language just shifts a little bit. And now we're looking at sales with returns and allowances. And in this case, we've got a customer returning merchandise, which sold for $15 and cost us nine. So the customer is going to give us all that merchandise back. and. It's important they're noting that these goods are not defective. And why is that important? Well, we wouldn't want to put defective goods back in our inventory, right? Uh, but in this case, because there's nothing wrong with them, customers just didn't like them or whatever, we're going to go ahead and send those back into our inventory. So we're going to basically reverse the sale. And we're going to give the customer back the cash. So it's going to be a credit to cash. And then we're going to um, debit not the sale but we're going to do sales return and allowances so we're going to still keep track of the sale and you might say well what's the difference why can't we just reverse the sale and the answer to that is as a business owner or as a manager or a shareholder or whatever you want to keep a really close eye on those returns and allowances because if that number gets too high, that should be a real warning sign that something's going on. Too many returns, too many uh, allowances given for defective stuff should be a red flag. So because of that, we're going to track um, sales and returns and allowances separately um, so that we can keep track of those. So we'll give them back their 15 bucks and we're going to debit sales returns and allowances. Meanwhile, uh, we're going to debit the merchandise inventory to show that the item is going back into our inventory and then we're going to credit the cost of goods sold so that we don't uh, subtract that from our income because we didn't actually sell it because we reversed the sale. Now in this case we're giving an allowance for a buyer that purchased some defective goods and we're still going to use that sales returns and allowances. That account is going to serve double duty for us. So not only is it going to track our returns, it's going to track our allowances. And so that's going to get a debit for the $10 uh, price reduction. And then we're going to give them back their 10 bucks in cash. And I'm going to stop here and we will move on to preparing adjustments and closing the books.